I'm honoured to introduce the plenary speaker today, Professor Rory O'Connor, whose talk is When It Is Darkest, Understanding Suicide Risk. Professor O'Connor is Professor of Health Psychology at the University of Glasgow, President of the International Association for Suicide Prevention, and a past President of the International Academy of Suicide Research. Rory leads the Suicidal Behaviour Research Laboratory at Glasgow and the Mental Health and Wellbeing Research Group at Glasgow. He's published extensively in the field of suicide and self-harm, specifically concerning the psychological processes which precipitate suicidal behaviour and self-harm. He's also co-author and editor of several books and is author of When It Is Darkest, Why People Die by Suicide and What We Can Do to Prevent It. He's co-editor-in-chief of the Archives of Suicide Research and associate editor of Suicide and Life-Threatening Behaviour. Rory acts as an advisor to a range of national and international organisations, including national governments, on the areas of suicide and self-harm. He's also co-chair of the Academic Advisory Group to the Scottish Government's National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. We're delighted he can join us today. Thank you, Rory, and over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Rosie, and thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll just try and share my screen um, and hopefully we can get going. Um, and I, 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 I want to make that full screen. And does everybody can see that okay? Yeah? Great. And no, I'd just like to add my word of thanks also to that, that Susan also mentioned about Rosie. Rosie does incredible work and um, in terms of promoting mental health in, in the profession. and. Um, and I also had the pleasure of examining Rosie's PhD. It was an absolute delight, which I will mention briefly in my talk. So over, well, that's our brief um, overview or, or background. Um, my plan is over the next, uh, you've got me until I think 11 o'clock. So between now, for about the next 40-ish minutes, I'm going to talk about really the work that we've been doing over the last few years in terms of trying to understand suicide risk. And, and really it's sort of framed broadly on a, a book I published this year. So I published the book When It's Darkest in, in May of this year. And, and really what that was my attempt to do was synthesize effectively what I've learned over the last 25 years of working in the field of suicide research and suicide prevention. And, and what I tried to do with the, with the book is give a broad overview of the sort of complex factors that lead to suicide, dispel some of the myths around suicide, and then focus in on my own model of suicide, which I'll touch on in a second, as well as then looking at what the evidence tells us in terms of understanding what works to prevent suicidal behavior. And then lastly, in the part four of the book, it's really trying to help all of us ask those difficult questions. A lot of the public health campaigns, it doesn't matter if you look at general public health campaigns or campaigns conducted by in occupations or by in organizations. We always, we always say this mantra now about reaching out for help, asking for help and asking difficult questions. And I touch on how we might support each other in doing that as well as then the, obviously the devastation at the very end of the book or the devastation of surviving the aftermath of suicide. And, and what in terms of what I'll, I'm doing today is dipping into different parts of that book, which sort of map out effectively the journey that I've been on in the last 25 years in terms of understanding suicide and self-harm, and, and then trying to think about how it's particularly applicable to uh, the context we're, we're speaking on today in terms of the veterinary context. But to me, what has been really important, I think for all of us, I think um, Rosie sort of highlighted this personal element in her introduction is we all will have been some way affected by suicide. And, and what I try to do in the book is bring together the personal with, with, with the professional, telling something of people's stories, including my own story as somebody who's been twice bereaved by suicide and how that impacted on me, both as obviously as an individual personally, but also professionally as somebody who every single day in life, I'm doing something on suicide. And, and then try to think about how that can impact or affect or hopefully help and support any one of us who will be affected by suicide. So just to sort of, that's a broad overview of what I'll try and do today is really, well, that is hopefully in the Q&A, we can talk about some of the questions or experiences that we've, we all have and think about as we try and challenge this um, huge devastation, the devastating phenomenon of, of suicide. So with that sort of overview, 
Um, I'm going to touch on the scale of the challenge and, and hone in on the um, on the stuff on on the, the scale of how many people dying by suicide each year, including the veterinary context and COVID. I'll touch very briefly on the myths around suicide because I think although we have made huge progress in challenging those myths, I think we've still a long way to go. And then the bulk of the talk really will be then in sort of in, in the model of suicide that I've developed, as well as understanding the transition. Then one of the things, one of the big challenges I think was we have in terms of preventing suicide is first of all understanding the factors that lead somebody to, to become suicidal in the first place but also how do we then understand who's more likely to um, cross the precipice from thoughts to acts of suicide. And at the end, touch on a brief intervention which has been shown to be effective uh, called safety planning. So a lot of the work I'll talk about today is, uh, has been conducted here in Glasgow with many colleagues within the Suicide and Behaviour Research Lab, which, um, which I lead. And then I'm just hugely grateful to the many funders of the work uh, that we do, including our standard re um, research councils, but as well as people directly affected by suicide who have chosen to um, fund some of our research in the search for answers to this most devastating of phenomena. So then, if we then think about the ripples of suicide, and, um, and this is something that I've been doing a lot about when I've been thinking about when I was writing the book last year, was trying to look at the, the devastation, the impact of suicide. And although every single death is a tragedy and, and sometimes we get, we get too focused on statistics, I still think it's worth highlighting the scale of the impact. And there's different ways in which we can do that. And here's just one way. If we look at the World Health Organization statistics, at least 703,000 people die by suicide each year. And in, I, I'm in Scotland, two, two people each day die by suicide. Now, and obviously, if you then think about the ripples of each of those deaths, Julie Carell, a, a clinical psychologist in the US, has estimated that for every person who dies by suicide, 135 people will have known that person in some capacity. So then if you look at the ripples and, and do the maths, then that means globally each year, there's potentially not about 95 million people potentially affected or knew the person who died by suicide. And, was, and of course, not all of those people will need support and help, but many will. So it really does sense, get, you get this sense of how suicide and its impact really is global. And, it, it's, it, and we will all at some stage either be directly affected ourselves or know somebody who is. And then another way of looking at the sort of scale of the challenge is every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide, and at the very least, another 20 will attempt suicide. Indeed, these statistics are likely to be underestimates because there are huge challenges in not only recording reliably suicide statistics globally, but the, the, the challenge is even greater in trying to get some sense of the scale of non-fatal suicidal behavior. And indeed, just again, just given the statistic in Scotland, uh, again, we, we've about 71% of, of all suicides in Scotland or by men. In the UK as a whole, it's about 75%. And, and, and in, the most, in most of high income countries, you have that th almost that three to one ratio of male to female suicides. The ratio is smaller in uh, low and middle income countries and else, elsewhere in the world. And there's a huge social inequality gradient of that suicide is much more common in more disadvantaged areas compared to more affluent areas. So that's the scale of the challenge in terms of the global context and a bit then on Scotland is um, obviously where I'm based. But if we're now here looking at the veterinary context, well, what do the data tell us? And the data are quite stark and concerning. And it doesn't matter when, which statistics or which study you look at, you always will find this elevated rate of suicide in, vet, in vets. So we've got either, it doesn't, there's different ways in which we can uh, conceptualize that or quantify that. One study shows that compared to other healthcare professionals, vets are twice as likely to die by suicide. And then, other, and then if we then compare vets to the general population, it's between three or four times more likely to die by suicide. So this is a real concern amongst the veterinary population. And then in a recent study published just before the pandemic from the United States, confirms that earlier work from David Bartram and, and Steve Platt, well, this three to four times 
for women or female vets uh, and, and twice as likely for male vets. So that, that doesn't matter which way we look at it, we have this elevated risk of suicide in, in vets. And then I mentioned at the outset, I had the pleasure of examining Rosie's PhD. And, and although Rosie doesn't focus specifically on suicide, Rosie's PhD is an incredible piece of work in that early phase of obviously that transition from, the, from student to practice in vets and looking at the mental health impacts. So I think as we move forward, what we need to, what we need to think about is what is it, our tailored responses, which may be protective for vets moving forward. And that's something maybe we can pick up on in the, in the chat after I've finished. But this is all before pandemic. So what I want to move on to now is just giving you some data on what we know about suicide risks since the pandemic and some work we've been doing in terms of monitoring people's mental health and well-being before I move on to the theoretical stuff about trying to understand suicide and suicide risk. So again, when the pandemic hits, me and many people working in the field of suicide research and prevention were really concerned because our fear was that there would be this perfect storm of factors coming together in the pandemic, which may be associated with increased risk of suicide. Now, in the larger study to date published, by, led by Jane Perkis in, um, in Melbourne and, and uh, Anne John in Swansea, published data, and me and 70 others were involved in this study, but looked at the impact of, of the pandemic in terms of suicide rates, but in the first covering, this, these data only cover the first part of the pandemic up until the 31st of July. But up until the 31st of July last year, the picture was really reassuring in that the data didn't show any consistent evidence of an increase in suicide risk. Now, the, we have to be cautious that that's really reassuring in that early phase of the pandemic, but we still don't know yet what the longer term impact will be. And one of the conclusions we draw on that paper was, yet yeah, that's really reassuring, but it's important to be vigilant because there are concerning signals. For example, later in autumn 2020, there was some evidence of suicide rates increasing in Japan. And, we, and the other fear is that as we, in the UK context, since September, we've had this um, removal of the supports that were in place, for example, further. Um, so we have to be really careful that as we recover from the pandemic, that recovery will be patchy and, and some people will struggle. And in terms of other signals and reasons to be vigilant, it's also supported for some data, or some work we've been doing, uh, led by in Glasgow here, of tracking people's mental health and well-being. Because the data that I've just shown you from Jane's study of 21 countries across, across the globe um, was that we only can look at the suicide rates at an overall top level. We weren't able to do any fine-grained analysis to look at any particular groups of people at risk. Now, at the start of the pandemic, I was able to get a group of people and funders together to set up the UK COVID-19 mental health and well-being study. And since the end of March of uh, 2020, we've been periodically monitoring people's mental health and well-being of at least a, a initially of 3,000 adults. But what we, we're assessing is depression and symptoms of depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts. So although we're not looking at suicide itself, we can get maybe some early indicators of potential risk. So what I want to just illustrate now is some data from the initially from the first six weeks of the pandemic, but what the important point of looking even at the first six weeks is we start to see that some groups of people have been more affected by the pandemic than others. And this idea that we were all in the pandemic together is certainly not borne out by the data because we're certainly not all in the pandemic together. We know that certain groups of people were certainly dying. Older people in particular were dying from the effects of the virus. But we'll, we'll see then from the data that some groups' mental health seem to be more affected than others. So I'm going to give you two or three slides, I think it is, on some of the data on that, on the early phase of the pandemic. And then I'm gonna just give you a sneak peek into the most recent data we have, which looks at people's mental health and well-being right up until, um, I think it is May of this year. So in terms of the early phase, this was published in a paper um, last, it came out first of all, the end of last year. And again, it covers the, that period from the end of March, 2020 to the beginning of May. And, those, and that was covers our first three waves of this study. And I'm really I'm going to give you some um, focus 
data on suicidal thoughts only, although we have a whole range of other markers. But, but there's a couple of key stark points emerge even from that early phase of the pandemic, which are really important for us thinking about understanding suicide risk moving forward. So the first thing is to note is that across those six weeks of the pandemic, the start of the pandemic, the, the self-report of suicidal thoughts is increasing. Um, and so that's obviously concerning that people, people's suicidal thoughts increased even over that short-term period of six weeks. Now, if we all think back to that period at the very start, I mean, we, we, we all, all of us, well, certainly I did, struggled to make sense of what the future would look like. So you can understand that over that six weeks, there was increasing concern and increase in this case, suicidal thoughts. But that's at the top level of all adults. But if you look at the data then for actually subgroup analysis, we see even more concerning patterns, which are really relevant. So if we look here on the left-hand graph, we've got um, age profiles. And what we and now countless others have published since is that the, and this idea of who's most affected is our young people's mental health. So our young people's mental health in terms of suicidal thoughts is significant. The young people are report, reporting significantly higher levels of suicidal thoughts than other age groups. And as you'll see in a second, that still holds even right up until the most recent data. So it's not just this effect early on in the pandemic. There's clear evidence of our young adults being uh, more adversely affected by the pandemic. And that's against the backdrop that we've known before the pandemic took hold is that young people's mental health has been, more, has been getting worse in recent years. And we think then about thinking about that in terms of people then going into training like uh, student vets or so on. We, we have a vulnerable group of people which we need to be doing more to protect. And then on the right-hand graph, although it looks as if females are reporting higher levels of suicidal thoughts than males, that, that that's not a statistical difference. And if we look at another group at risk, people from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, again, what's been borne out by a range of other studies, individuals with um, from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds are reporting higher suicidal thoughts across all waves of pandemic not just these three ways I've illustrated here, but this is a clear effect right across the pandemic. And then one other group, which is really, really worth focusing on, is those individuals who had pre-existing mental health problems before the pandemic started. And this is a really stark statistic. So even at wave three here, within six weeks of the pandemic taking hold, 20% of people reporting who had pre-existing mental health conditions before the pandemic are reporting significantly markedly higher levels of suicidal thoughts than those without pre-existing mental health problems. So clear evidence here, even from the early phase of the pandemic, that suicidal thoughts are elevated in some groups of people more than others, and that this just gives you some sense of some groups we should be focusing in on. I want to just give you two other slides on this study, and then I'll move on to the myths and then understanding suicide risk. So this is the most recent data, includes the most recent data up until wave eight, sorry, it's July, sorry, wave eight covers right up until July of this year. And you can see some descriptors of what was going on across the UK. Now the good news, the good news in, in terms, of if you look at the left-hand graph, is that there seems to be no further elevation in suicidal thoughts. So that is reassuring. However, if we look at the right-hand graph and we look at our young people again, so our young people see here, we can see here at wave, at wave seven, at wave seven, that's really when we had, we were back in lockdown if we think about the UK context, but we can see the, the young people at wave seven were reporting the highest levels of suicidal thinking than they did at any stage of the pandemic. So the reason for really highlighting that is, again, moving forward, we have a group, a cohort, potential cohort effect of young people being adversely affected at all stages of the pandemic. Now, the good news is that wave eight, there's some evidence of recovery when, when we there was an easing of lockdown measures. And hopefully, obviously, as we continue to recover, that we will not be returning to lockdown. So that's good news. But we still need to think about particular groups at risk. And I think that's really important and incumbent on all of us to be vigilant um, for suicide risk moving forward. Okay, so that. I thought it was just useful to give that COVID context as we all recover from COVID. Now, what I want to move on to now is just say a few words about 
some of the myths around suicide. And I'm only going to talk about one or two of the myths here. And but, but what I think is really interesting about looking at myths around suicide is in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been huge progress in tackling the myths around mental health and to do with suicide. But this slide here, taken from my book, lists 14 myths. And these are 14 myths that I first talked about in a public talk in 1996, I think it was, in Belfast. And what, when I was writing the book, I went back to those original slides to see, well, actually, how, how have we done in terms of making progress and challenging those myths? And the sad reality is each of these 14 myths is still evident. Now, potentially, they're less evident than, what, than when, when, the, when I first talked about them in the 1990s. But the reality is, although we've made some progress, our journey is far from over. But I want to just, well, I'll just focus in on one in the interest of time today. And again, these are all described in the book. And a really important one for the context of suicide prevention is number four, is that, the, it's, that it is a myth that asking somebody about suicide will plant the idea in their head. There's just no evidence for that at all. However, there is evidence for the contrary. Or there is evidence that if you ask somebody directly whether they're thinking of suicide, not only does it not plant the idea in someone's head, there is evidence that it increases the likelihood that that person would get the help and support that they require. So, of course, asking is only part of the whole sort of toolbox for suicide prevention, but it's a really important one. So I really would encourage anybody, if you're concerned about a loved one, a colleague or friend, please ask them whether they're suicidal because as I say, it could be the start of a life-saving conversation. Okay, that was just to give you some sense about the myths, and I think it's important that we, we do more to challenge these myths around suicide. Um, but what I want to move on to now is trying to address, and the last sort of um, part of the talk is really this understanding bit of the talk, understanding and then a bit on what we can do to um, intervene. Suicide prevention and understanding suicide is complex. And this is a sort of, bias like a social model that we published a couple of years ago and, I, and I'm not going, going to go into it in detail today I want to just highlight a couple of key points from this slide it is genuinely to highlight this idea that if we're to understand suicide risk it is multifactorial it spans biology psychology social context cultural context and so on and it, we have to take a developmental context we have to we look at the lifespan to understand suicide risk we know, for example, that early life adversity is associated with suicide risk, and I'll return to that shortly. But what I want to really focus in on is these proximal factors, right down at the bottom here, is trying to understand what I would, you'll see in a second, is my sort of thesis is that although there are many, many factors associated with suicide risk, what's crucial is to understand how those factors impact on the way in which an individual views their past, their present, and their future. And for, for, for too many people, for the 700,000 people, suicide is, is driven by this feeling of being trapped, this sense of being trapped or entrapment by mental pain. And that what I'm going to move on to now is trying to understand the emergence of that mental pain. And then we can all think about, well, what might, what might be the drivers to that mental pain? And are there particular drivers in the veterinary context, which are, are in part explain why there is this elevated risk of suicide. So then to unpack that understanding of entrapment then, a couple of years ago, in 2011, originally I published the IMV model of suicide. And then I updated it with my colleague, Olivia Kirkley in 2018. And I wanna, again, with, for the purpose of today, just highlight a couple of key points. So again, it was my attempt to bring together the different theoretical understandings of suicidal risk. But I want to just focus in on for today, purposes of today, on the motivational phase and the volitional phase. And, that, um, and basically, in a very simple way, what the model argues is that suicidal thinking within the motivational phase, suicidal thinking emerges when somebody feels defeated and or humiliated from which they cannot escape. So that sense of entrapment, that sense of mental pain is part of the final common pathway leading to the emergence of suicidal thinking. Now, of course, what causes defeat and entrapment 
is will, will there be a multitude of factors and it'll be different for different people. And that sense of defeat and entrapment can also be driven by rejection, by loss and by shame. But to my mind, what we're trying to understand is how that those things lead to somebody feeling trapped. And so you'll, you'll see in a second, that's one of the things that we've done a lot of work on is looking at entrapment as a predictor of suicidal thinking. So that's the first key point in the model, as I would argue, is that the co-presence of defeat and or humiliation from which you cannot escape that entrapment is a key driver to the emergence of suicidal thinking. And then the second point I want to make about the model is moving from the motivational phase to the volitional phase is this idea that the factors that govern, or oh, the factors that increase the likelihood that somebody acts on their thoughts of suicide, crosses the precipice from suicidal thinking to suicidal acts are different. So the factors that, that govern that transition are governed by the volitional phase. I'll return to that in a few minutes time. So the argument is the factors that lead you to become suicidal are different from the factors that help us understand who will act on their thoughts, who will cross the precipice from thoughts to acts. And I'll return to those volitional phase factors in a second. But before I do, I want to just show you an example of one study we've done recently in Scotland in which we've, we've highlighted the importance of entrapment. And this is just a 12 month follow up study we did predicting suicidal thinking over a 12 month period amongst young adults. And the key take home message from this slide is that entrapment and feeling a burden on others are the key drivers, the key explanatory variables for suicidal thinking over time but in particular, internal entrapment. And internal entrapment is internal mental pain, that having these thoughts and cognitions that you just can't control of, that you're a waste of space, that people would be better off if you're dead, or as feelings of shame or a burden on others. And that internal entrapment is, is so important. And to my mind, then, for trying to understand suicidal risk, we need to understand the drivers of that sense of entrapment. And indeed, how we go about assessing it most recently is using four questions from a longer scale. But I've just highlighted these just to give you a sense of what I mean by entrapment. As you can see here, just if we look at number three, number three is an example of a question which is tapping internal entrapment. I'm simply just asking somebody how trapped they feel inside themselves. So although this is part of a clinical scale, it's something I think we all can be thinking about if we're concerned about a loved one or a work colleague or a friend or whoever it may be. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on entrapment for the minute. That's, it's important in the emergence of suicidal thinking. And the, here's some of the questions you might go about thinking about how we operationalize. it. Now, before I move on to the sort of transition from thoughts to acts of suicide, I wanted to say something about another important factor, which I think has become even more important in the context of COVID, but also in the context of people living and working and perhaps more um, rural areas. Now, of course, rurality is not necessarily associated with loneliness, but I, I thought it's useful just to, to highlight in this context. So my colleague, Heller McClellan, the PhD student here, has been doing a lot of work looking at loneliness and suicide risk. And indeed, she published a review of the evidence base, a meta-analysis of the evidence of, the, of all studies predicting suicidal thinking and behavior over time. And the take-home message, don't worry about the details of the of the, of the forest plot and so on. But the key detail is that yes, there's clear evidence that loneliness does predict suicidal thinking and behavior over time, prospectively. And then it might be explained by levels of depression. So people who feel lonely, much more likely to feel depressed and depression is associated with suicidal risk. But then the other thing that Heather has shown in one of her empirical studies is she's shown that and I just worry about this right hand figure. Don't worry about the left. Oh, don't worry about the right, the left hand figure. But relating this to, to entrapment, Heller has shown that people who report um, that their high levels of loneliness and they're reporting high levels of entrapment, they're much more suicidal. So again, when we're thinking about trying to understand the process, the suicidal process, we can start to see how these different factors come together to increase suicidal risk. Okay, so that's just sort of useful um, highlighting the importance of loneliness and its relationship with entrapment. Now, in the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to touch on 
the crossing the precipice, crossing the precipice from thoughts of suicide to suicidal acts. And that, and this is a quote from a mother I met. It's a heartbreaking quote from a mother I met who lost her son to suicide. And for those of us bereaved by suicide, it's a challenge in the, we all face and the guilt that we all, all feel, what we could have come, done differently. Why couldn't we have seen the signs? Why we were unable to um, prevent the loss of our loved one? And the stark reality is our ability to, to predict suicide is no better than the flipping of a coin, the tossing of a coin. But what we can do is better understand who may be more likely, who may be more likely to cross a precipice from thoughts to acts of suicide. And then that last bit of my model, if you think back to my model, the right-hand bit of my model, I said the volitional phase is key to understanding that risk. And so what I've done in the next slide is I've just blown up that right-hand bit of my model, the volitional phase, to help us make sense of that transition. And so these in the middle here are a whole series of volitional factors. And my, my, my argument is that people who think about suicide are more likely to transition to a suicidal, suicide attempt in the presence of each of these eight factors. Now, I won't go through all of them here today. I'll just highlight a couple of them. So the first one is if somebody is thinking of suicide and they have ready access to the means of suicide, they're more likely to act on their thoughts. And I think that's a really important one in the context of vets and access to drugs and so on and to, and to other way, means of suicide. On to the next one, three, knowing somebody else, we describe it as exposure to suicide or suicidal behavior. So if you know somebody, if you're having thoughts of suicide and you know somebody who's attempted suicide or died by suicide, you're more likely to act on, on your thoughts. I'll do another one here, which is fearlessness about dying. You have to overcome the sort of life instinct. Now, I think this is an important one, I think, in the context of vets, because in veterinary life, you're repeatedly or um, exposed to death and, I, and there's a question about to what extent that repeated exposure to death in an animal context sort of habituates your attitude or changes your attitudes towards death in general and our concern might be then that that fearlessness about death might be lower in, in, vet, in the veterinary context or in other contexts of people exposed to suicide or exposed to death more generally which then can increase the likelihood that you'll act in your thoughts of suicide. Okay, so just that's all I'm going to say about that. And that, but the, I suppose the key take home from that slide is that people who have thought of suicide, it's the presence of these volitional factors, which is key in understanding who's more likely to act on their thoughts of suicide. And we and others have done a whole range of studies now highlighting that, highlighting the importance of, the, of these factors and differentiating people who just think about suicide from those who attempt suicide. Now, the last sort of empirical bit on understanding I want to move on to is understanding the stress response. Because obviously, when we work in, in professions in which are stressful or in any context in which we encounter stress, we, we basically, the body releases cortisol. And it's one of the stress hormones, the fight or flight hormone, which we need. We need cortisol to be, to be released to help us basically either um, deal with that challenges or the threat we're experiences, experiencing or flee the situation. So I'm just going to give you some, on some, of the, uh, some data on some of the work we've been doing looking at that stress response. And the key take home is that there's evidence that people who attempt suicide, that their, um, that their cortisol system, their stress system is dysregulated. And what's happening is that whereas we need cortisol to be released when stressful situations occur, and people who've attempted suicide, there's a blunted or flattened cortisol response. And I'm also going to link it in with childhood trauma, because again, we've been doing some work, which is looking at the relationship between childhood trauma and suicide risk, but crucially also childhood trauma and regulation of the cortisol or the stress response system by HPA axis. So the reason for highlighting childhood trauma is because there's a whole body of research highlighting that experience of childhood trauma is predictive of poor physical and health outcomes over time, and including suicide risk. And here's just one example from what a study we did, is that comparing people, we've got three groups of people, people who've attempted suicide, people who've thought about suicide, and people with no suicidal history. 
And in each indicator in the black bars, each indicator, there's clear evidence of people who've attempted suicide reporting significantly higher levels of childhood trauma, irrespective of any of the indicators. And indeed, if we then look at that in terms of moderate to, to severe levels of childhood trauma, in the people who've attempted suicide in one of our studies, 80% have reported severe childhood trauma or moderate to severe levels of childhood trauma. So in this study, what we also were able to do though, was look at the relationship between people's historic childhood trauma and how much cortisol they released in the laboratory when we did one of our experiments. So in some of our studies, we bring people with different suicidal histories into the lab, and then we can do this um, stress induction. We can activate the stress system doing this psychological induction. And that, what that's really good at um, us looking at is it gives a way of tapping into how well the stress system is working. Because during this experimental study, people are repeatedly um, given the saliva samples and we can then look at how much cortisol is released during this study. And what you'll see in a second is well, the first thing to highlight is in our studies, we've shown that people who've attempted suicide, when we do this experimental study, they, they, they show evidence of this flattened cortisol response that I mentioned already. But what we've also shown is, if we're asking ourselves, well, actually, what else might explain that flattened cortisol response? We see the childhood trauma does. So this is, an ex this is people's cortisol levels in one of our studies, people who've either, either thought about suicide or attempted suicide. And we've then just people categorized into how much trauma, oh, how much trauma they told us they've ex been exposed to. Now think about this for a second, that this is people telling us about how much trauma they've experienced up until the age of 18. So many years previously, and the average age of people in our study is about 30. So what this illustrates is if you just go to this black line here, what I'm indicating here, that is individuals who, who told us that they had ex been exposed to high levels of childhood trauma. And that high level of childhood trauma is predicting how much cortisol people are releasing in our laboratory today. And these are people who've been previously suicidal. So again, what it helps highlight is if we bring together the childhood trauma data, the psycho psychophys data in terms of the cortisol with the idea of entrapment, it gives you an idea of the complexity and the sort of perfect storm of factors that can come together to increase suicide risk. So as I sort of try and have a few more slides just now and hopefully as we end the talk in the last few, few minutes in terms of what we can do to help. And um, what I've tried to do is it's, as we've gone along and hopefully we can look at this in chat is, well, let's think about what factors may contribute to that sense of entrapment and suicide risk in the, in the veterinary context. And I've highlighted some examples already. So in the last few minutes then, well, what can we do then, crucially to interrupt the transition from suicidal thinking to suicide attempts? And, and indeed, there's, if you look at the evidence base, this is something we published a few years ago or a couple of years ago, the good news has been that in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been an increased focus in particular on psychological or psychosocial interventions for helping people who are suicidal. And, and so that's good news. And actually there's been a lot of focus on this one here, safety planning interventions. And what safety planning is, is a very brief intervention in which we, we, we um, work with somebody who's in crisis to identify the warning signs that a crisis is escalating. And then, a ways, and then to think about ways in which they can keep themselves safe, including um, keeping the environment safe in terms of restricting access to the means of suicide. It's a very brief intervention. Sometimes it's been supplemented with telephone support, but what it illustrates in these brief interventions is, although suicide is really complex in terms of its antecedents and the factors associated with suicide risk, sometimes brief interventions can be helpful. Now, of course, I'm not, just suicide prevention takes so much more than these, but it's another tool in our toolkit, um, which I think is important in that interrupting the transition from thoughts to attempts. And indeed, we published a meta-analysis looking at safety planning earlier in the year. And that meta-analysis illustrates that these safety planning interventions, again, don't worry about the, the statistical details, but the take home is 
that these safety planning interventions are effective in reducing suicidal behavior. And indeed, it just if um, the, I, I basically give an example of one study we've done in Scotland, we've done a feasibility study. And not only, so we can't determine clinical efficacy, but what's really interesting, we did our, our feasibility study. This is with people who had attempted suicide, who we'd seen in hospital. And basically what's really encouraging is we know that repeat suicidal behavior is common in the, in the um, weeks following an index suicide attempt. But the good news with this sort of brief intervention and telephone support was that in those weeks following discharge from hospital, almost 80% of the people who received the safety planning intervention actually used it. So hopefully that may have prevented them taking their own life or attempting suicide again. But we've still have so many unanswered questions. So one here I've illustrated is we don't know, um, we don't know what is important in terms of what aspects of safety planning are particularly important and to what extent it works in isolation. But to my mind, it's an important, it's an important um, message for us to think about is although suicide is complex, interventions um, can, can well, we all can do even brief interventions which could be, or could be effective. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just to close, because I think actually for some reason my, my concluding slide is missing, I just see from my, my slide deck. So I'll give you what the conclusions were going to be. So what, what, what I want to end with though, is I've just touched on understanding and then I've given you one very brief intervention. But I think it is useful for us all to think about what is special in terms or what special considerations we need to think about in the veterinary context to prevent suicide. And that there are so many different approaches to understanding suicide risk. Well, my last slide is here. For some reason, I couldn't see it, but my last slide is here. Oh, that's good. Um, is it what I've tried to illustrate over the last 30 minutes or so, whatever the length of time it's been, is that trying to understand suicide is this emergence of pain and people feel trapped by mental pain. And that suicide is so often not about wanting to die, but wanting the mental pain to end. And that what we're all trying to do then is, if we're trying to prevent suicide, what we need to think about is looking, yes, of course, attacking and treating mental health problems, but suicide prevention is so much more than that. We need to tackle inequality. We need to tackle the stigma which, stigma which prevents people from reaching out for help and also prevents all of us asking people about mental health problems and, and those loved ones around us. Thinking about discrimination and COVID-19. And then I think as I've tried to illustrate a bit as I've gone, gone through the talk is, we, there's no one size fits all. We need to think about in this context today of what's increasing risk in the veterinary profession. Is it something to do with exposure to death repeatedly? Is it something to do with isolation or access to services? Is it something to do with the stress and nature of the job and the profession? Is it something to do with more broadly access to the means of suicide? And then very lastly, and the very last point is, when we're thinking about suicide prevention, yes, thinking about what drives people to become suicidal, but also then think about what we can do to interrupt, interrupt those suicidal thoughts so that people don't act on their thoughts of suicide. And hopefully we can tackle the 703,000 deaths by suicide each year. Thank you.